number 13. 13 is an interesting number in the Bible, and an uh, interesting thing happens here in Genesis chapter 13. I'll invite you to stand with me just for a little bit. Genesis chapter 13, we're going to read about four verses here, and you can sit back down after that. Genesis chapter 13, starting in verse number 7. Now, let me also say that uh, I want you to look at the picture up behind me. And no, no, the, no, I have it there on purpose. Some of you go, oh, that's the wrong one, Pastor. No, it's the right one, I promise. I, I want you to look at that, and I want you to, to, to consider. It's sort of funny, but it's sort of sad at the same time, you know. It looks like one of the Chick-fil-A cows, you know, eat more chicken. That's what it looks like. Um, but uh, anyone want to guess what, what happened to the cow? Who, who said that? Okay, you got it, you got it. Genesis chat, grass is green on the other side. Normally what happens is you get stuck. Genesis 13, look at verse 7. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And uh, this morning I want to talk to you about the greener grass complex, always looking for greener grass. And that's exactly what Lot did here. We're going to talk about that. Father, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, bring a stillness to us this morning. Uh, Lord, I pray you'd be with those that are sick. Please be with uh, uh, Coulter and, and, uh, and uh, the Gaines family, Lord. Uh, thank you so much for bringing Sailor New this morning. Lord, please keep your hand on uh, baby Lily, Lord, and, and help her to continue to heal up. Father, I pray for uh, anybody else that may be under the weather, Lord, and those that are traveling. Um, Lord, I pray that you'd be with them. Lord, be with those that, that are here. Uh, Lord, never uh, do we want to neglect to pray for those that couldn't make it. But, Lord, I, I pray, Lord, as you did for the disciples in John 17, Lord, you prayed for those that were right there in front of you. Lord, I pray for them this morning, Lord, that, that you would speak to them, Lord, and, and you'd minister to hearts. And, Lord, I, I pray you'd help us to see that sometimes... Lord, uh, we get caught up in looking at something better, and we ignore what's on our side of the fence. And uh, Lord, I, I pray you'd help us to learn contentment. Lord, help us to learn some things through lots of mistakes. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Be seated if you would. I heard somebody say, the grass is greener on the other side because the septic tank overflowed. You ever heard that before? <laughs> uh, sometimes that's true. Matter of fact, on my property, I don't have the city uh, sewage. I've got a septic tank, and, and you can tell where that septic tank sits. It is always green there. It does not mean I want to eat that grass, all right? It doesn't mean I want to sit there and have a picnic either, all right? I know what's under the surface. Now, you know how we are as people. Oftentimes, we look at something that we don't have, a situation, a family, a spouse, a church, whatever. Sometimes even in ministry, we look at that thing and we go, man, if I just had that, that would be way better than what I have right now. And that's what Lot did. It wound him up in a world of hurt. I want you to go back, though, to chapter number 12. For those of you that don't know the story, not familiar with it, understand that Lot is, is uh, Abram's nephew. And uh, what happens here is, is this. They, they are traveling together. They're in uh, 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 Haran. And as they're in Haran, the Lord speaks to him in verse number 1, Genesis 12, 1, and this is what God says. The Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. 
and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Well, I have a feeling, based on verse number 4, that because Lot goes with him, there's a good chance that Abram shared the story with his family. And Abram says, hey guys, God came to me, and he says, look, whoever's going to be with me is, and is on my side, God would bless them. Whoever curses me and is against me, God would curse them. And where I'm going is a land that God's prepared for me and my people. And he, he starts telling them everything God told him. And Lot goes, that sounds great. That sounds great. I'd like to go with you. Because where you're going sounds better than where I'm at right now, right? I mean, Lot was just there. He's just living with his family, not doing a whole lot. So he goes, hey, that sounds exciting. Look, if you would, at verse number 8. Verse number eight, or verse number ten. I'm sorry, and you learn from the the, the verses prior that what happens is that Abram uh, continues to move closer and closer to where God wants him, but in verse ten something happens. It says there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And, and what's interesting is I I can't necessarily prove this from Scripture, but based on chapter thirteen and Lot deciding that he would move away from Abram. The very one that he says, I want to go with him because God said he would bless him. And where Abram goes, he'd be blessed. And the people that bless him, God would bless. I want to be with Abram. And yet a chapter later, he goes, you know what? I want to go that way. Part of what I believe happened in Lot's life is he goes, hey, there's some problems along the way to get to God's blessing. I don't think I want to stick around for this. After all, there was a famine in the land. You know what Lot says? This is a little harder than I thought. Matter of fact, I think the grass might be greener on the other side. I don't know if I want to stick around for this. In chapter 13, what ends up happening is the, the herdmen, the, the workers of, of Abram's, uh, like a Abram's cattle company, those that worked for that company were fighting with those who worked for Lot's cattle company, and they couldn't get along. And they go, hey, the land's not big enough for both of us. So Abram says, like a gentleman, he says, okay, Lot, whichever way you take, I'll go the other way. And Lot looks up. You know what he does? He does what we do. Look back, if you would, at verse number 10. I want you to notice that Lot never prayed. He never asked God. What do you think about this? You know what's funny? Sometimes it could be a job opportunity. It could be a, a physical, geographical move. It could, be any, it could be a number of things that we look at and we go, that looks good. I'm going to do that. And then after everything's a mess, then we go, hey, God, where are you? <laughs> You know what the Lord's saying? You never asked for me. Lot never even prayed. The Bible says he lift up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. Verse number 10. You know what greener grass complex causes you to do? It causes you to avoid strife at any cost. In chapter 12, it was a famine. In chapter 13, they're fighting. And rather than just sitting down and working it out with Abram, you know what Lot does? Okay, hey, yeah, sounds good. As long as it means I don't have to go through any more hassle, I don't have to go through any more work, if it's easier and it looks better for me and my family, that's what I want. You know how many times Christians will get in strife one with another, and instead of working it out, you know what they do? They just split. <laughs> you know how many times families will go through the same thing? And instead of a husband and a wife through the work of the Holy Spirit, working it out rather than just busting up their home and going through a divorce, you know what they do? They just they say, you know what, it's too hard. We're incompatible. Last I checked, incompatibility is not grounds for divorce in the Bible, guys. Sorry. And so what am I saying? Oftentimes we look at the easy way out. I've heard people tell me this. I've heard people say, Pastor, I didn't have any problems until I really got serious about God and started coming to church. And you know what? I don't, I don't, I don't say I, I doubt that you're being honest. I believe you. I believe you. I believe that you understand that we actually have a spiritual enemy, right? And when you start getting closer to the Lord and you start getting closer to that promised land, things are going to come up that didn't come up before, and you're going to have some strife. And how you deal with it determines where you wind up years later. Lot says, well, it's easier for us to split up. Let's just do that. You know, I think of another man, and, and let me just say this, too. Everyone looks at Lot like he's this terrible guy. I want to I step away from that for a moment, and, and I want to say he's really, <laughs> he's not that evil of a guy. You know what he is? He's a good guy that looks for the easy way out. Because in the New Testament, when you fast forward to the New Testament, the Bible says that he vexed his righteous soul. We're going to look at that verse. 
And he was righteous. He was a good man. But you know what he did? He looked at the easy way out. When there was strife of any kind, when he's sitting in the gates of Sodom, rather than saying what is right, he keeps his mouth shut wide. He didn't want to rock the boat. And, and rather than saying, Abram, look, I'm your family. I want to be with you like Ruth does with, with Naomi. Hey, where you go, I will go. Where your God is, I will be there, and I'll worship your God. Lot doesn't do that. He just says, you know what? You go your way, I'll go mine. Why? Too much work to work through that strife. Too much work to work through that resistance. Can I say this? In your life as a Christian, there are going to be times where there's resistance against you doing the right thing. And what you do at that point in time could make or break you for years to come. I want you to think about David. You know who David is? David is a, David's a good man. I mean, do you know anybody else in the Bible who's called a man after God's own Heart. The Bible says it in Acts 13. It mentions it in 1 Samuel 13. He's a good man. And yet, he's not a perfect man. And one thing that I notice about David, go to 2 Samuel chapter number 13, 2 Samuel chapter 13, something that you notice about David. When your eyes are constantly set on the next big thing, your eyes are constantly set on the greener grass on the other side of the fence, and you're always looking for that easy way out, you end up ignoring the things that are, be, that, are, that are growing and growing and festering and festering in your life that you need to address. David was a good man, but you know what he did? He ignored his son, Absalom. 2 Samuel 13, I want you to look, if you would, at verse number 35. And Jonadab said unto the king, Behold, the king's sons come, as thy servant said, so it is. And it came to pass, as soon as he had made an end of speaking, that, behold, the king's sons came and lift up their voice and wept, and the king also and his, all his servants wept very sore. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai. You say, what happened here? What exactly took place? Amnon, the son of David, forces his sister Tamar, his half-sister, who happens to be the full sister of Absalom. Absalom, to exact vengeance on him, has him killed. And you know what happens when Absalom flees? David doesn't do anything. He lets it go. Should have gone after Absalom. He should have dealt with it. You say, why? Because that's what a father needs to do. But he's too busy running a kingdom. Look at chapter 14. Look at chapter 14. Verse 21. And the king said unto Joab, Behold now, I have done this thing. Go therefore, bring the young man Absalom again. Let me try to explain what happens in chapter 14. In chapter 14... Basically, everybody in the kingdom acknowledges that David and Absalom need to deal with one another. There's something not quite right with David. And everybody, except for David, like we do sometimes, everybody except for David realizes the problem is he hasn't addressed Absalom since he killed his brother. Since Absalom killed David's son, there's been no communication. And you know what they do? They, they, they sort of do this play. They, they play out this skit where eventually David realizes, okay, all right, guys, I get it. I need to get things right with Absalom. So here's what happens. Verse number 22, Joab fell, again, fell, fell to the ground on his face and bowed himself and thanked the king. And Joab said, Today thy servant knoweth that I have found grace in thy sight, my lord, O king, and that the king hath fulfilled the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. Now I want you to notice this. And the king said, let him turn to his own house and let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house and saw the king's face. So after all that time, David goes, you know what, you're right. I should get things right. Bring Absalom back. And when he gets back, David says, uh, don't want to see him. I don't know if I can address it right now. You understand when you're always looking to the next thing and you're always looking at these other things you need to do, you'll ignore strife at any cost. You know what a preacher will do? He won't preach on certain subjects. You know what a Christian will do? They won't witness the people they ought to be witnessing to. You know what a father will do? You know what a man will do? He won't lead his home. You know what a mom will do? She will quit caring about her kids. She'll just say, whatever, I don't care anymore. And you know what? And this thing just keeps growing and growing and growing. And you expect somehow, think, you know what people do? I've had this happen to me before. I, I've had family tell me, oh, now look, this is not me bragging or anything like that. But I, I, I do love my kids, and they're a blessing to me. They are. And they're little sinners. Sweet ones, pretty ones, but little sinners, okay? But I've had people say, uh, in my family, my, and my sister knows some of the, the, these conversations have happened, oh, your kids are so good. What do you do with them? You want to know, for real? 
They don't pop out good. I'll tell you that. Kids aren't born. You know what they're born as? Sinners. You know what it takes to get them to have godly character? Not to say that I have hit this mark by any means. We have learned, we're still learning things every day. And our kids have their own free will. You know what? They could grow up and turn their back on God. That could happen. I pray it doesn't, but it could. So I'm not saying we're something great, but I'll tell you, anything that is right is because of biblical principles that were applied, and it was work. It wasn't just, oh, wow, they were just so much, they're just born so not, no, they're not. You know what they're born doing? Ah, wah, wah, feed me, feed. They're selfish, right? And you got to work at getting them to be unselfish. And you got to work at teaching them to say thank you and please. And you got to work at all these things. You know what that is? It's not easy. You know what people want? They want the easy way out. People will look at a marriage and go, oh, they're so happy. Oh, man, if I just had a husband like that until you live with him. Yeah. Oh, man, she's beautiful. If I had a wife like that, I would really... No, 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 no. Because you know what you do? You're just seeing the surface. And furthermore, you have no idea if they do actually have a godly marriage, how much work and how many afflictions, how many trials they went through, and rather than just fleeing each other, and rather than falling apart, they came together and fell on their knees and asked God for God's help. Time and time again. And people will look at that and go, oh man, if I just had that, do you really want it? It's work. It means you can't avoid strife at any cost. You know what David does? He avoids strife. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with it. Say, so what happens? Look, if you would, at the same chapter, verse 32 and verse 33, Absalom acts out, and he actually causes a big ruckus, and he sets Joab's field on fire. And uh, basically to get, you know, when kids act out, oftentimes they do it because they want attention. They can't get it the right way, parents. That's something to note as well. But Joab, uh, Absalom acts out, and, and, and Joab says, Hey, David, you better deal with your son because if you don't, I will. Here's a little nugget for you. Joab and Absalom, you know what they are? They're cousins. You guys know that? Joab is the son of Zariah, David's sister. And whenever David says, Ye sons of Zariah are too hard for me. He's talking to his nephews. Isn't that something? And so Joab says, hey, David, uh, Uncle David, <laughs> respectfully, if you don't deal with Absalom, I'm going to. He just set my field on fire. And finally, because David is forced to address it, they hug each other, they kiss. David weeps a little bit. But then that's all you read about it. See what happens in chapter 15. Look, at, if you would, at verse 23. David is exiled from his own kingdom because Absalom rebels against the king and tries to establish himself. You say, what is that? That's years and years that go by of David ignoring a problem that was right there. Why? Because he was too busy and he was looking at other things and he was busy with this and boy, my kingdom and the battles we had here and I had to conquer this and I had all this other greener grass stuff to take care of. And you know what ended up happening? He lost his kingdom because he ignored addressing his son. You say, well, he gets it back, not without Absalom being killed, not without the kingdom ever being the same. Things are different after that. You say, why? Because when you're constantly looking at greener grass, you know what you'll do? You'll avoid any kind of conflict in your life rather than dealing with it the right way. I want you to see something else. Go back to Genesis chapter 13. I want you to think about this this morning. And I hope it's not too much of a distraction, but I am going to keep this picture up here all morning because I want when you go home and you think about Genesis 13 and you think about things that you're looking at in your life and you just say, if I only had that, I want you to think about that. Because we look at that and we go, what a dumb cow. You know what the Lord looks at us and does sometimes? Oh. <laughs> you know what he sees? That's what he sees in us at times. They're just, they're, they're grasping for something they think they want it so bad, they think it's going to be the best thing for them, and all that's going to happen is they're going to get stuck. Genesis 13, I want you to see that greener grass complex causes you to see things in a different light. I want you to notice in verse number 10, when he lifts up his eyes, look what it says. Look at how he sees this place. It says that, that this is the, the place where the Lord destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, but look what it says. Even as the garden of the Lord, he looks at this land. He goes, man, 
That looks exactly like what my fathers had told me paradise looked like. And our great, 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 great granddaddy Adam told his son. And then he told his son, it, sound, it looks just like paradise, like heaven on earth. Everything I've always wanted. Have you ever, as a Christian, prayed for something and then years later looked back and said, thank you, Lord, for not giving me what I prayed for? I have. You say, what happens? He looks at this place and he goes, man, this is something. This is beautiful. I can make a great living there. My family would enjoy it. The best schools are there. I mean, it's just great. It's a perfect place. They're building this new community there. I'd love to be a part of Sodom and Gomorrah. Wouldn't you like to join me? That's pretty much what he said. Looks like paradise. You know what a lady will do when she gets disgruntled with her husband? She'll find a man that listens to her and cares about her feelings. And they'll destroy her marriage. Do you understand what the... I, I heard this. This is sad. The second largest dating website in the world is a website called Ashley Madison. Do you guys know what that is? I'm glad you don't know what it is. It is a website created for people to cheat on their spouses. Second largest dating website in the world. We're doomed as a society when that becomes the second largest dating website. A, a lady will say, I just want to find a man that listens to me. A man will say, I just want to find a woman that treats me like a hero. And then, you know, she's always dressed nice. And she's always, you know what people do? They look at what they don't have. It might be a spouse. You know what some people do? You know what? I am tired of listening to this guy, this little Puerto Rican short little thing. Who does he think he is? Uh, every Sunday, grant for 40, 45 minutes, talk about sin in my life. I think I'm just going to find somewhere else to go to church. You know, I don't like my friends anymore. I need new friends. I don't like my this anymore. I need a new this. Sometimes what you think you need is not what you need at all. And you'll look at something that God, you guys understand, God lives in eternity, correct? So God is a, a being that is not bound by time. That's why it's interesting when the Bible says, ye are seated in heavenly places. You go, don't feel like it. I feel like I'm sitting in a brown chair, you know, on the side of a bank. That's where I feel like I'm sitting right now. All right? But the Bible says, according to God, ye are seated in heavenly places. Why? He's not bound by time. He's looking out at the end of the thing. We're still here. And, and, and so when you think about that, God is looking at what Lot's looking at, and God's going, Lot, if you could only see a couple years from now, the place that you look at and you think is paradise is going to be a literal, and I'm not trying to be, you know, loose with my language, a hell hole. It will be burnt with fire. Lot doesn't see that. All Lot sees is paradise. And you know what you'll do? The same thing. Whenever you start looking at something that you think you just got to have, and you don't stop to say, Lord, should I have this in my life? I mean, let's, let's be honest. How many, uh, how many American Christians, when there's a, let's just do this, when there's a job opportunity, let's say it's in a different state from where they're at, when they're in a good church, and there's a job opportunity. I can tell you a true story about a family that I knew in Idaho moves to Minnesota because of a job opportunity, and then years down the road, their family is destroyed. Why? This simple fact. They got a job that was two hours away from the closest church. So guess what? Church was an afterthought. Why? Because the money was there. Why? Because I looked up, and it looked like paradise. It was well watered. Everything was green. You know why I pre uh, this message came to my mind? I've been doing nothing lately in my yard but trying to get that brown to turn to green. And Matt Baca, bless his heart, man, he's, he's like the, the guru. If you guys want to know how to turn your lawn green, ask that guy. He says you've got to water it this many times, then you've got to put fertilizer, and it's finally turning green. Oh, it's so beautiful. But you know what's going to happen eventually? It's going to turn brown again. You understand that, right? It will die. The thing that we look at and go, oh, man, I just need that, eventually it's going to fade away. And you'll be left with nothing but your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you be content with that? Lot looks up and he sees things in a different light than how God does. How do we look at things, honestly? Do we actually ask God, Lord, what do you think about this? Should I take this job? Should I marry this person? And the answer for my daughters is no, no, no. You don't marry anybody ever. You good? Okay, all right, all right. Just give them a hard time. I told them, you guys can start dating when you're 30, but they have to work on my property for 10 years before they can have you. 
you know, sometimes when you start looking at things and maybe it's a material possession, maybe it's a, a decision about a career, maybe it's a, a relationship, whatever that thing might be, you don't ask God and you just look at it through human eyes and you say, I want that, I'm going to get it. Don't be surprised if the outcome isn't a lot like Lot's was. I want you to notice in Genesis chapter 14, turn there with me if you would. We're going to have to run through this because I want to make sure we get to some other things here. But in Genesis chapter 14, I want you to see that from Genesis chapter 12 to chapter 19, you read a lot about the life of Lot, and it's just put in there in little portions of Scripture here and there. In chapter 13, or chapter 14, rather, what ends up happening is him, uh, he goes into captivity. You know where he was? He was in Sodom. And you know what he's doing? Just living his life. Like a lot of Christians are in the world, just living their life. They're not doing anything wrong. They're just surrounding themselves with things they shouldn't be around. But they're just living their life, and they're providing for their family, and their kids are going to school, and they're going to work, and they're doing their thing, and, and just happen to just ignore the counsel of God on the move that they just made. But, and so they end up finding themselves in a place where they did not intend to be. There's a big battle that takes place, and these kings come, and they take away the king of Sodom and all the inhabitants of Sodom with them. So you know what happens to, to, to Lot and to his family? They're taken into captivity. And it is not until which time that God brings Abram back into Lot's life that he's set free. Wouldn't you think that would be a wake-up call for Lot? You know what greener grass complex causes? Captivity. You lose your liberty to serve the Lord Jesus Christ when you're constantly looking at other things. You lose your ability to have fellowship with him as you ought. I heard this many years ago when I was in school. And I believe this. I'm glad that when I was in school, they did not teach me that the most important thing in my life is my church or my ministry. Now, that may not sound right to you, but it, it, just bear with me. The most important thing you have is your fellowship with Jesus Christ. You know what Lot didn't have? Fellowship with God. A good man, but out of fellowship with God. You see, how do you know? God didn't speak to him one time while he was there. Until the angels come. You know what's interesting? God has to go to Abram about Lot's situation in Sodom. He doesn't even talk to Lot. He's in captivity in chapter 14. Go to chapter 19. Skip with me a few chapters later. I'll say this. Greener grass complex causes you to sit where you do not belong. There are places that a Christian should not be in this life. And I don't just mean geographically or even physically. I mean spiritually, the frame of mind, uh, where you find yourself in your, in your walk with the Lord. There are places that you have no business being as a Christian. I want you to see where Lot was. Look, if you would, at Genesis chapter 19 and look at verse 1. There came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Now, you may not think anything of it, but if you understand Bible history, what you have, when somebody sat in the gate of a city, they were viewed as an elder. They were viewed as, a, as, a, as an authority in that town. Basically, for you to come into that town or that city, you had to talk with Lot to get a feel for what that city was about. And Lot is someone that knew what was right. He knew that he should have been with Abram. He knew what was right before God. And yet there he is in Sodom in a place that is wicked. And he's a representative of that city. Guys, it would, it would almost be like me saying, you know what? Uh, I am going to be uh, the mayor of Sin City. <laughs> right? I mean, that's really what Lot did. He sat in the gate of Sodom. Everyone that came in and everyone that came out, he was the, one of the first faces they saw coming or going. He was a representative of that city. He had no business being there. You know what he was? He was out of place. You know what a Christian is? When they pursue something that God does not want them pursuing, and when they leave people and things behind that they should not leave to pursue the things that they want, when God is in, in, has no part in the thing that they're trying to pursue, you know what they are? They're like a fish out of water. They're in a place that they don't really belong in. That's where Lot's at, sitting in the gate of Sodom. Now, let me ask you a question. Knowing what some of you know about Sodom and Gomorrah, Good place or bad place? Bad place, right? General terms here. Bad place. Here's a man that's a great picture of a Christian. He knows what's right. He knows where he ought to be. 
He's not there. And really, at this point in time, he doesn't care. You know why? Because he's still making money. He still has a good living. As a matter of fact, to be a person that sits in the gate of a city, you had to have some wealth around you. You know what you learn from Lot? It seemed as long as God didn't touch his pocketbook, he would just continue to progress. And I don't know how else to say this. I think as American Christians, we, we, don't, we really haven't been through persecution. You know what we consider persecution? Now, now look, it is persecution. I get that. The, the couple in Oregon that's being fined $135,000 for not baking a cake for a, a gay couple. You guys heard about that? All right. Now, last I checked, there's like thousands of bakeries in Portland. Could have found another place, but anyways, they wanted to get it from there. And so here you have this couple. And you know what, what's gotten everybody up in arms? Well, yeah, the, the religious liberty side is one thing, but you know what else? $135,000 would go, oh. You know what it is for us? I just realized this. As Americans, when someone touches our money, that's when we pay attention. You know what happened a lot? He didn't care until the money was touched. He didn't care until his substance and his family was threatened. God said, I don't want you there. This isn't where you belong. He knew that, but he wanted to be there. See, what happens? That place, that seat is a place of rest. You know where you ought to be at home? You know where you ought to feel at home with God's people? You know where you ought to feel at home in that book? You know where you ought to feel at home on your knees? It should not. Now listen, I understand when someone first gets saved and they start coming to church. I mean, uh, this is, let's just be honest. Singing songs that are, you know, 100, 200 years old, it's a little weird, right? After you've been around it for a while and you start realizing the words and the depth of those things, it is home for you, is it not? But it, it does take some time. But I, I'll tell you this, you as a Christian, you ought to feel out of place where the world feels at home and the other way around. You should not feel at home in this world. I don't just mean, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. I mean, you shouldn't feel at home in places where the world enjoys their sin. It should bother you. It should make you feel like you're out of place. I can tell you right now, man. Someone invites me. I, I tell you right now, this is this. You don't. If you don't have this conviction, that's just fine. When I walk into a restaurant, and it's an hour wait, and like, hey, we can seat you at the bar. I'm like, eh, that's okay. I'm just not at home there. You make, you be, well, pastor, you're not going to drink anything, are you? No. This doesn't feel right. You say why? Because I see everything that's going on around me, and the language, and the attitude, and the spirit. And people losing their control, and I feel like this isn't for me. Why? Right, God brought me out of that. But you know what happens over time? I bet you when Lot first moved to Sodom, he goes, ooh, there's some stuff in around here that I don't know about. But after a couple of years, you know what he's doing? He's sitting in a seat of authority in that town. That did not happen overnight, guys. That took time. You see what happened? He looked, and he goes, man, look up there. It's beautiful. And he got closer. Oh, man, it's even nicer than I thought. Oh, man, we've got to move to that place. And when he moves, he realizes, oh, there's some issues here. But we can work through them. I mean, you know, after all, I've got, I'm, I'm saved. I'm, I'm sealed with the Spirit of God. That's how we are Christians. I won't lose my salvation, so I, I'll just go in and just be around it. I'll be okay. No, you won't. No, you won't. It'll affect your family. I want you to notice. Look at Genesis chapter 18. I want you to see something. Genesis chapter 18. God never addressed, and I want to point this out, greener grass complex causes you to not hear the voice of God. I want you to notice in Genesis chapter 18, from verses 1 through 5, you know what happens? The Lord appears to Abram and Sarah. And you know what the Lord does at the end of that conversation? He says, uh, hey, um, by the way, um, I'm going to destroy Sodom. Oh, Lord, you, you got my, my nephew's over there. You, got, you can't just destroy the whole place. I mean, he starts with, you know, 50 righteous people, and he works on a 20, then 10. He goes, what about one, you know? And so, and so there's Lot, and, but understand this. Lot is there, and he's living his life, and he's doing what he's doing, and God never goes directly to Lot. God comes down in the pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ. He comes down, and he addresses Abram about Lot. That's a sad place to be when you're in a mess and you don't realize it and the Lord has to speak to somebody else about you so that they can pray for you. That's basically what you have in that story. You say, what happened? Well, 
When you go to chapter 19, you figure out that things did not end the way that Lot planned for them to end. No one ever gets on the internet and finds someone they shouldn't be talking to, and they don't ever think about the end of it. They just think about what they want right now. Nobody ever goes and says, you know what, I can sacrifice church and taking my family to church because I've got this great job that pays great money that will provide for my kids. When they're this high, they don't think about the consequences of them being this high later on in life and them growing out without the Lord Jesus Christ. People don't see that. You know what they look at? They look at what they want and what they want right now. And let's face it, guys, we live in a culture where you can do that. I mean, if you don't have the money, apply for a credit card. Get a line of credit and just borrow. I mean, you can just pay it off later, right? How many of you, when you were younger, maybe, you know, I mean, I'll tell you this right now. When me and Lacey first got married, I got to tell you a funny story. We tried, I think, five times to apply for credit. Could not get it. Everyone says, oh, Adrian, just go to a, you know, like a Lowe's or a Home Depot or a JCPenney's. And I did that. I kept getting rejected. I'm going, what in the world is going on? What I realized is they were taking Adrian Dominguez Jr.'s Chapter 7 bankruptcy from the 90s and putting it on Adrian Dominguez the third. That's me, okay? And you know what I realized, though, about 10 years later? I'm so thankful that that happened because I avoided so many issues that if I had had a card that just gave me what I wanted when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, I'd probably still be dealing with that debt. See, what happens with a lot? He looks up and he sees a great place to live and a great place to make money and a great place to grow his substance, but he never considers he loses his fellowship with God in the process. I want you to look at chapter 19 again. We've got a lot of younger families in this church. I want you to consider this. Um, this isn't just for you. It's for everybody. But it's really easy. And I'll, I'll just, without going into detail, I'll just tell you this personally. Lacey and I have seen some things that you know, we're, as, as your kids get older, we're looking back and going, oh, man, we probably should have done this like this. And we're seeing that some of the things that we did or didn't do have an effect on our children now that they're 13 and 11. And I'm sure as they get older, we'll probably see some other things like that. So, so parents, please understand that just because they're this tall and they can't talk back to you and they have to go along with the program doesn't mean there's coming a day when they have their own free will because there will come that day. Look at chapter 19. I want you to see that as a result of chasing that greener grass, Lot loses his family. Look, if you would, at verse number 14. Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. You know what happens when a Christian has been living in the world and they've been just doing their own thing. And I'm not even saying they're necessarily doing a bunch of wicked stuff. I'm just saying they're just doing their thing. I can't tell you how many times I've knocked on a door and talked to someone who is saved. They're born again. And I see kids in the background running around. And they said, yeah, I was raised in church, got saved when I was 10, raised in a Christian home, uh, just, you know, busy working, doing stuff. And I look inside that home and I think, man, if you could only see 20 years down the road the consequences of your lack of desire to follow the Lord in your kids' lives, in your marriage, in your own life, in your walk with God. Hey, let's fast forward beyond that. Let's go to the judgment seat of Christ where you're going to stand before your Savior someday and he's going to say, why didn't you give me more? Why didn't you serve me more faithfully? You had to say, if you're honest, I was chasing greener grass. Lot goes to his sons-in-law, and he says, look, guys, I got some bad news. God's going to destroy this place. I think, <laughs> come on, man. What are you talking about? What do you mean God's going to destroy it? He's talking about this old-fashioned God who's just up there trying to kill everybody off, who does things wrong. I mean, Lot, what are you talking about? That's old-fashioned. You're crazy. They laughed him off. All of a sudden, Lot realizes God is not joking about this, and he wants to get things right with his family, and it's just a little too late. Look at verse 26. He loses his sons-in-law. Verse 26, his wife looked back from behind him. She became a pillar of salt. He loses his wife. Without going into all the details, from verse 32 to the end of the chapter, you, you learn about how his, him and his daughters are defiled. 
things are never really quite the same after that. You say, where did it all start? I mean, God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. His wife turns to a pillar of salt. His daughters commit incest. I mean, the thing goes on and on. It's just a mess. Everything ends. Do you, do you think, honestly, if you could just take it and just sort of take a panoramic view from a video camera and show Lot, Lot, here's the end, do you think he'd believe it? That's not how this thing's supposed to end. In Lot's mind, it ends with him and a family reunion. They're having a good time. Everybody's happy. We've got all this stuff. Look at what we've done. Look at how well we've, we've made it. I mean, we started off with Abram. And yeah, things were rough at the beginning, but look at how blessed we are now. And at the end, it's not how it goes. You know, sometimes I wish I could take stories in the Bible and make them like a happier ending, you know? Uh, I joke with my kids sometimes because they'll tell me, they'll be, you know, starting to tell me a story about this thing that they saw or this thing that they read in a book. And, you know, they're, they're really into it. And then I say, all of a sudden, and everybody died. They go, Dad, stop, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but the reality is some, there's some stories I'd like to take in the Bible and rewrite in my own carnality and say, no, that's not how it ought to end. That's not how it should end for Lot. He's better than that. He knew better. He came from better stock than that. Just like most of us have. The Lord has saved us and he's placed our feet on a solid rock and he's established our going and he's shown us what is right. And yet oftentimes we say, Lord, I know what you say about it, but boy, that looks really good. Lot never thought it would cost him his family. I want you to look at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Can you be content this morning in your fellowship with Jesus Christ? Do you have to have that new car? Do you have to have that new thing? I'm not saying it's wrong if you buy a new car. People just listen to me. I'm not saying, I, I heard this a long time ago, take it or leave it, do with it what you will, but I believe it's true. God does not have a problem with you having things. God has a problem with things having you. God doesn't have a problem with you having money. He has a problem with money having you. But, 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 but really, uh, if you look at your life and the things that you have, if I were to say, okay, show me your wish list, your, your wish list. show me your, your bucket list that they now call it, the things that you just have to have before you die. If you could do these things, what would they be? If you know what it is for most Christians today in America, it's not man. I'd like to see 10,000 people saved around me. You know what it is? I'd like to go tour the world. And then what? You're going to die. And we're going to have to show for it. I'd like to go do this, and I'd like, to, I'd like to, to, to have this much land. By the way, I want to point something out about that. My land in Bennett cost me less than the houses do in Aurora, okay? I got a sweet deal, all right? But I'd like to have this much land. I'd like to have this, and if I had this, I would be happy. No, you wouldn't. There'd be something else. If I had a different spouse, I'd be happy. No, no. If I had a different church, I'd no. Oftentimes you look at all these things out there and what you're not seeing is it's you that's not happy because you're not right with the Lord. And nothing is settled right anywhere else until it's settled with God. Lot. God's commentary on him. 2 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 7. I'm sorry, verse number 6. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot. Just Lot. He's not just saying just as in like only Lot. He's saying just as in righteous, a good man. <laughs> just Lot? How is he a good man? Look what it says. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. It grieved him where he was at, but he stayed. You say, why? Because he was chasing the American dream, <laughs> so to speak. He was chasing the, the happiness that comes from having these things. And boy, it was a great place to live. Verse 8, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. So why'd you stay, Lot? I found greener grass. And when he found it, he couldn't leave it. You say, why? He was stuck. 
Years ago, Russell Cornwell told of an ancient Persian named Ali Hafed, who owned a very large farm that had orchards, grain fields, and gardens. And he was a wealthy, wealthy man. One day, a wise man from the east told the farmer all about diamonds and how much more wealthy he could be if he had a diamond mine. See what he did? He sold his land, and he wanted a world tour to go find diamonds. He died penniless, broke, and he committed suicide. You know, it's interesting, years later, the man that bought his land had his camels drinking from a fountain one day, and he noticed this shiny substance coming out of the earth. You know what it was? <laughs> diamonds. The largest diamond mine in that part of the world was sitting on that man's property the entire time. You know what happens with us at times? We're sitting on it, man. You're sitting in the place where God wants you right now. You've got a book in your lap that means a whole lot to the Lord, and it should mean a whole lot to you. And you've got your family. You've got things that God says, look, where you're at right now, there you're sitting on a diamond mine, and you don't even realize it. You say of Ali Hafed, what a fool. Hmm? Not much different than us. Let me ask you, Christian, what's the greener grass that you're looking at? We'll close with this one verse, 2 Timothy chapter 6. 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy chapter 6, excuse me. 1 Timothy chapter 6. You know what some preachers will do? Hey, let me, let me confess something. I'm, I'm gonna actually, in a couple weeks, going to preach a message at me. It's about pastors. I think everyone, we'll probably have a packed house. I want to hear a pastor preach against pastor. Amen? <laughs> All right? But uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. What preachers will do sometimes is, I've seen it. God will have them in a church of 50, 60, 70 people, and they get a call from a church that has 200, and they won't think twice about it. It must be the will of God. You don't know that. You just figure there's greener grass there. Somebody will be in a position where they have an opportunity. And I look, I, I'm just saying this. Whatever it is you're going to do as a Christian, preachers are not exempt from it. We all face the same thing. We all face something in our life where we look at it and we go, that would be better. That would be easier. That would mean more for me. Instead of looking at it and going, God, are you in this? Lord, is this right? Lord, what can I learn from where I'm at right now? What are the lessons and what are the blessings and what are the things that you have for me right now that I'm sitting on, that I'm ignoring? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 6, it says this, But godliness with contentment is great gain. You know where the greener grass is at, whether you realize it or not? It's where the Lord's at. And it's where you're content in Him. I guess my question to you this morning, Christian, is simply this. Are you content with Him? Or do you need something else? What is that thing that you're looking at going, if I just had that, or I'm going to get that some way, some way, some shape or form. I'm going to find a way to get that thing, even if God's not in it. Can I just warn you? Because I love you. Can I warn you as a friend? Can I warn you and tell you sometimes getting what you want doesn't result in the way you'd like to see it end? Will you be content with Him? Let's all stand. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, we thank you for examples that you give us in scripture I'm in no way shape or form glad that Lot experienced that that he lost that Lord that he would never uh, see the joy that Abraham saw towards the end of his life Lord that paths that, that were uh, split Lord and just really one major decision that changed him and his family's destiny forever Lord, uh, pray that you'd help us to see, Lord, there's decisions, and I don't know what they all are, but there's some decisions your people are facing right now. 
or big decisions some, in some cases, maybe some of them seemingly small. But Lord, if they don't take heed, or the, and they just react in the flesh and just do what looks right rather than really get a hold of you and ask your opinion and get you in the middle of it, Lord, there's so many things that they could lose in the end. I pray that you not have anyone go through that. Lord, that would be my prayer this morning. Lord, that your people this morning would, would learn from the lesson of Lot. And Lord, just help us to see, Lord, we are saved. We've been justified. We've been cleansed. Lord, we came to church this morning with clothes on, and we ate this morning. And You've been so good to us. Lord, teach us contentment. Lord, I pray if there's any heart that's straying this morning from you, or any heart that picks up this book and just finds it as stale bread, doesn't enjoy it, any heart that comes to church and just, Lord, they're not getting anything out of it. Any heart that just isn't getting a, they're not really in fellowship with you, Lord, that today that they might see that it might be a result of just chasing some greener grass. Lord, they may not be like the cow in the picture and get stuck in this world. Would you be with your people and speak to them now? In Jesus' name. If the Lord's spoken to you, I pray that you'd respond to him. understand you could change your family you could change your preacher but that doesn't change you what changes you is contentment being happy with what the Lord's given you being happy and joyful with the opportunities that are in front of you right now Oftentimes, the reason why a second or a third marriage doesn't work out for most people is because they went into that marriage thinking the last one failed because of the other person. Instead of looking at the situation and realizing, it's me. I need to change. I need to be content. The Lord needs to change me. And that's easy to point out in marriage, for sure, but... What about as Christians, just your own individual walk with the Lord? I'm convinced sometimes we're, <laughs> we're of the mindset that God needs to change and not us. He needs to change my circumstance, then I'd be happy. That's not how it works. Not at all. The circumstance God has you and He has you in for a reason. Grab your hymnal, turn to 296, your blue hymnal this morning. 296, all the way my Savior leads me. We'll sing the first and the last verse.